I don't know if you know this, but exactly to the day today, you know, Facebook reminds you of like where you were yep. a year ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly today was the first time we ever came here. Really? Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So we've got a flight of, of all of your core range products and then a special cask finished one. Yes. So if you want to walk us through it. Yeah, yeah. So we, I, I kind of believe we've got three core range whiskeys and then a couple, um, you know, the white that kind of tags along and, sure. and then some fun stuff as well. Um, so we'll start with the whites. You know, the white, um, I feel, is more of an educational opportunity um, right. for customers when they come in, um, mainly because of what we're going to taste next. Um, the white is the unaged version of our triple distilled. Which is your Irish style. Irish style, yep. yeah. Exactly. So obviously Irish whiskey has to come from Ireland. Um, if this would made there, if this were to be made there, it, it would qualify. Um, it meets all of their qualifications. Um, but it is um, uh, a single malt is the only one of the only few kind of differences than a lot of Irish whiskeys. A lot of Irish whiskeys might have some um, other grains in them, or, or perhaps some unmalted uh, barley, um, a single pot still. Correct. Style, yeah. yeah. Yep. Whereas ours is, is is more of a you know a triple distilled single malt. But we're not going crazy with a lot of specialty malts in this. We're looking for just a real clean malt character. Um, no smoke. Um, but, um, we want we wanted this to be our approachable whiskey. Um, and and if if you want to you know uh, mix this uh, any of our products with anything, this is probably going to be the one. And this I'm, is, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead to the Irish, um, but no. the, the, the white is, you know, like I said, the unaged version of that. So when the customers can come in and do a flight and taste it side by side, you just see this light go off in their head, and so much of what they thought was whiskey came comes from the barrel. Right, yeah, this shows you this is the grain distilled, and then the exact same thing, but the influence of the wood that it, that it uh, matures in. And especially when, um, I, you know, I can have them taste the white, and the furthest thing from their mind off is whiskey. Right when they try it, you know, right. they they wouldn't say whiskey if, if I hadn't already said it, and so it's it's kind of neat that they can kind of see um, how almost foreign the um, kind of the base spirit is on its own mm-hmm. um, compared to a finished whiskey. Yeah, so this is uh, also a hundred proof. I think everything yep. else you do is a hundred proof. Everything we do, yep. yeah. Keep it keep it very simple. Everything we do is a hundred proof. We feel like that's actually overshooting probably the ideal proof for tasting on a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but it gives the customer an opportunity to taste it as they wish without overwatering. Sure. So you can add a little bit of ice um, if that's your thing. You can add a splash of water. Um, you know, whereas if you do that at eighty proof, chances are you're going to be watered down pretty quickly. And what, what generally does this come off the still at uh, before you? Have so to we are barely that. legally whiskey. Um, we kind of um, whiskey has to come off the still. Um, the aggregate of the pot has to come off the still at one hundred and sixty proof. And Right. So we are pushing that on this product. I see. Um, that see. third distillation, you know, really ups the, the proof quite a bit. Um, you know, our first run might get us, you know, 50 proof. Our second run might get us 120, and then that next one, we are right at that 160 mark. Um, and so um, that often determines when we stop collecting. Actually, in our pot is when we can get the aggregate below 160. Gotcha. It'll actually start above 160. So we're talking over 80 percent alcohol. Um, and so it's, it's pretty hard to taste. It's hard to evaluate with that proof. So we'll constantly have to kind of water it down as we go just to, just to taste and evaluate it. And that, that's actually what we're running today. Um, right. When we're done, and maybe we can get some video of it, we can go over and, and check that out here. Man. Yeah, one of you guys, uh, just we took a peek back there just a few minutes ago, and, uh, and you were running this. And, yep. and it's um, the smell in the room, even several feet away from the, from the pot there, it's... Yeah. it's uh, <laughs> It's pretty intense, and, the, and you know, there's so much, you know, such a high alcohol, you know, percentage on that. Yeah, you're going to get a very spiritous uh, vapor in the room, for sure. I feel, I feel like uh, you can, if you're used to what malt whiskey tastes like and the character of a malt whiskey, you can tell that <coughs> that's what's going on here. Yep. You know, I feel especially in the finish, kind of that lingering taste, you get a little bit of that classic kind of just general scotch flavor. Exactly. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a little easier for this style of whiskey too, and um, for a scotch perhaps that isn't quite as barrel dominant mm-hmm. as a, maybe a well-aged bourbon might be. 
Um, and so it's not going to quite as much of that oak character. You might be able to pick up a little bit of spirit. Right. That was a that was another thing I was curious to get your take on. Is um, I feel like your whiskey is kind of one of the most similar to a Scotch style <coughs> of anybody in the state that I've had. Uh, yeah. I might, you know, I might put Balcones in there, but it's it, that's more of a dense. Uh, it's got a lot of weight. Balcones to Balcones is Balcones, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. it's oily, it's rich, uh, it's thick, it's yeah, it's incredible. Um, yeah, they they do a, a good job at, at what they do, and uh, I might compare them to more like um, an Akintoshin or something like that, a, a very dense one where you guys strike me as being a little more like a Balvini. Or uh, something along those See, lines. That, you know, and that's going to be kind of tying back to that traditional copper pot still. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of um, folks that are doing whiskey, um, even if they'll, they'll, they'll have a hybrid still perhaps, and even if they're not using the plates and they're running it through, those plates are going to have some kind of effect. And sure. So, you know, just having that raw, basic pot still, you know, I think is going to be, you know, um, a, good, good bit of, a good bit of it. Yeah. The, the, the triple distill, that third distillation just really cleans this up quite a bit. Um, you know, we definitely don't have vodka here. It's definitely got quite a bit of flavor to it. Right, absolutely. But um, it's it's blendable to me as a white rum. I feel mm -hmm. uh, maybe not on vodka. I wouldn't do a you know a vodka martini or something. But you know, as a rum, something that's going to have a little bit of that that funky character to it. Yeah. Um, you guys put this in several cocktails in the bar, right? And so that's been a, this has been this spirit has been a big win for our our cocktail menu. Yeah. It's definitely not something I'm I'm probably going to spend a lot of time drinking neat or, or anything sure. like that at, at home. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun to play with, and and again. And just kind of getting um, the opportunity to kind of educate our customers on um, what flavors come from the barrel and what flavors come from the grain and then the distillation part, I think has is, is just been an invaluable. Um, spirits are so mysterious um, to customers, much more so than I think beer wine is. Exactly. You have and, to spend you know, a lot of time and, and, and uh, you know, read a lot and, and spend time with, with guys such as yourself uh, and, and having these experiences of trying different types of spirits and, and consciously thinking about it as you try it to yep. uh, to tease out those differences and so that, that's cool that you guys are uh, having a little bit of a focus on teaching people as well when they come in here. You know, a lot of it has to do with the fact that you can't make this stuff at home legally, you know, home brewers. Sure. Um, uh, there's a lot of home brewers out there and they were a big force behind the craft beer movement and so they came into your brew pub and they knew how beer was made mm -hmm. and so there wasn't any BS in allowed. And, right. And so I think there's still a lot of BS involved in kind of the spirits industry just because Nobody really knows what what claims are true or not, um, and um, but that's changing, right? right? You know, especially as craft beer people mature and get a little older, maybe drink a little more whiskey and a little less beer. I think we're going to see more of that as well. Um, they're going to demand um, transparency and more information on the process. Right, right. I, I know as as I've gotten educated in it, it's valuable to me to, to be able to look at a label and be able to sell. Here's where it came from. Here's what it's made of. You know, etc. Yep. Uh, the more information, the better. Yep. So. So the next one is the uh, the triple distilled, mm -hmm. uh, basically the aged version of what yep. we just had, the white whiskey. So this is kind of our homage to Irish whiskey. Um, you know, it's got a little bit of um, innovation, um, mostly tradition, um, and so we uh, age this in a combination of new and used barrels. Um, we will have um, all of our whiskeys. Sorry, I should mention this earlier. Are two years at this point. Mm -hmm. um, obviously constantly aging our stock. Um, we feel like this is kind of a minimum age, um, and so. Um, Still being the youngest whiskey in the bottle is two years correct. when you say that, and then exactly. there may be a certain amount of older ones. Yep. Yeah. I think the oldest whiskey we have in house is probably three years. Um, we we held on to a few barrels, and and we are holding on to some barrels for you know eventually some five year product as well. So interesting. We'll release that in a couple years. Have you guys been you've been using an assortment of sizes of barrels too? Is that right? A little bit. We started with 25s, um, and we felt that was a good compromise between the big barrels and the small barrels. Um, you know, I know um, a few distilleries have had some great luck with small barrels, but I think right. many more have not, probably. Right, yeah. Um, and, and so we didn't want to go five gallon, um, necessarily, um, so we felt that 25 was a good compromise. We, we got whiskey out in what would have been two years in a, a little over a year, so it was still wasn't you know a month or two aged whiskey but it was um, it was definitely faster um, than, than the bigger barrel um, you know eventually um, 
cost eats you up on those small barrels, mm -hmm. and they cost more than the big ones do a lot of times. And oh, really? I didn't know that. 25s at least did at that time for us. Um, sure. 25s were more than 53s, and so you're buying twice as many of them, and they're more, and mm -hmm. yeah, we committed to the 53-gallon barrel early on, and we definitely don't regret it now. <laughs> right. It's been tough over the last few years, um, you know, right. getting everything aged a little bit longer than we would have. Yeah, um, but um, but we're definitely glad we did. Yeah, it seems it's like it seems like there's there are some distilleries that use the small even down to the five gallon barrels. If they know how to treat it and know how to handle it, you can get a good product out of the other end. But uh, in general, the bigger the barrels are, the more time you have to let it age, especially here. Right? And I know I know um, distilleries that have had success with small barrels have great relationships with their coopers. They're not mm -hmm. just buying these things off the shelf. Right. You know, I think our our experience with the small barrels was um, a lot of inconsistency um, and um, no charring. We've, we've got a lot of small barrels that were just not charred. Oh wow! Yeah, um, just a real a real light toast, and that was about it. And um, so I'm sure they have a lot better control over those things. Right, right. So guys who are doing well with those, I know a few distilleries have done well. With them. Mm -hmm. uh, are you primarily using? Uh, American oak yep. or all American oak? All American oak. All American oak. You know, the only French we might have might be on a cask finish or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. All American oak primary. Yeah, this is um, so much different from from the white. It's 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 almost unrecognizable yeah. between the two, right? And fun. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and it just blows. I mean, you just see smoke coming out of the customer's ears sometimes when they're doing this. They go, "This is the same product, how?" And, and so it. Um, but then it's it's a great kind of transition, or I mean, then we can talk about other age spirits. You know, I mean, even if we're not selling them, we can talk about rum or tequila and why those are the color they are and why those taste a little bit similar to this. And sure. And then all of a sudden, it just really opens their mind up um, to the entire world of spirits and why things look the way they are. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that's a lot of fun too, is to talk about how barrels were used to make tequila and rum and brandy and, and, uh, and the similar flavors that they'll have. And so you know we are finding a lot of overlap there um, in the whiskey world with with rum and brandy, sure, and, and tequila a little bit as well. Right. Which uh, you you have some of those uh, type of projects branching outside of the, yep. the core whiskey range. You're trying a few different. We will always be Andalusia Whiskey Company. Yeah. Um, and that'll be 95 percent of everything we make. Yeah. Um, but we'll do some fun projects here and there. We're probably going to do a rum every year, a brandy every year, a great brandy, and possibly a fruit brandy every year. So. Oh, that'll be fun. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, we, so in the books right now, we've got our, our great brandy, and um, we're about halfway through the rum project right now, so we'll get into that here in a little bit. Yeah, yeah, the the, uh, the, the sugar cane juicer you were telling yeah, me about. I'll show you all a trailer, half full of trailer sugar cane out there in a little bit. We'll take a look at it. All right. Yeah, this is, uh, I, I really, really like this. Was there a... Um, was there a particular type of Irish whiskey you had in mind when you were creating this? No, um, you know, we, we wanted one that was a little richer than some of your kind of mainstream Irish whiskeys. They're all, mm -hmm. to me, an Irish whiskey is, um, you know, going to be a lighter, more delicate whiskey. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we wanted to kind of fit in that category, but still, you know, um, you know, have an element of richness, uh, you know, a kind of a, a house level of richness to all of our, our spirits. And so, well, we wanted it to be the yeah, smoothest uh, um, whiskey. Um, we definitely um, didn't want to whip out on it. And, right. And so it's, you know, it's yeah, really hard to compare um, commercially. You know, I, I get a lot more of new barrel character than I often get um, in Irish whiskeys. Um, so you're going to get more vanilla. Um, even, even a little bit of coconut. Coconut for sure, absolutely. And caramel. Caramel, and then just a, a little bit of kind of spiciness to it, not much. Yep, just a, a touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of those baker spices. Yeah, that's great. Um, so the the next one is uh, Revenant Oak, which is more of in a Scottish style. Yep. Uh, uh, double distillation, right? Yep, so everything else from here on will be double. Um, we really kind of wanted to, to just mimic um, Scotch, you know, typical whiskey production on this one. And um, so we are peating our own malt. Um, so we import peat from Ireland right. and we smoke all of our own malt. And so that's pretty unusual. Um, 
one of the many distilleries in the States doing that. Um, there are a lot of cool distilleries um, experimenting with American peats. Right, like Westland. Yep, yeah. Northwest and a little Northeast. And so I, I kind of wish we had some Gulf Coast peat. I don't think <laughs> such a thing exists, but if it does, we'll find it. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, we'll use it and we'll try it. Yeah. I'm feeling that pretty much is, is petroleum. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, generally, <Just> peat. <laughs> generally, uh, when you have a peated uh, expression in America, the, the barley is peated by um, somebody in England yep. or exactly a company in Scotland. Yep. So you'll yeah. buy peated malts, right? And um, you know, we already had kind of dreams of a hardwood smoke whiskey, which we'll get to in a minute. And right. so when we, you know, already knew that we were going to be doing some smoking. Um, you know, we um, and we're going to be building the smokehouse, and that's what kind of the idea of smoking around came about. Uh, sure. Sourcing peat was tough. Um, you know, we had a lot of people tell us you're just not going to find it. It's a very niche product, I imagine. It is. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not peat moss or sphagnum peat or whatever the stuff you can get at the Home Depot. I mean, this is a different animal. Um, of all places, of course, it's on Amazon. And <laughs> really. It's sold um, in a retail uh, format to people that are from you know, Ireland, Scotland, and they grew up burning peat in their fireplaces, and they just want that smell in their home. Interesting. So this is sold really almost as firewood, but yep. yeah, for, yep. for so Ireland. You can buy you know, big bag, big boxes and bags of cut bricks, and it's about the shape of a brick, a building brick, mm -hmm. and, um, and I can grab you all a few chunks and we can look at it. And, uh, and, and burns pretty well, yeah. and uh, the smell is just incredible. right. And it just we got a new batch of peat in recently from a new area, and it's totally different. And so we we made them, you know, like a notation in our in our brew logs. Okay, from here on, we're using a slightly different peat, and so the whiskey's going to taste different. So. Oh, so for you were getting it was kind of sourced from one spot in Ireland, yep. and now that's still shipping. Ireland, probably not terribly different, but right. it's. I mean, the peat looks different. It definitely smelled different when we're burning it too. Right. I mean, I think that's you know for folks that are into uh, into whiskey like. The distinction between an Isla peat and a Highland peat is is very clear. It's absolutely not, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. So that's yeah, that's well understood. I think amongst the real peat heads that you know um, terroir really plays a huge part mm -hmm. in, in your final product when, when you're talking about the peat. Right. So this was kind of fun to you know, play with some, and then really more than anything allows us to um, vary the level of peat that we use. Right. Um, you know, we've got a couple little fun one-off things. You know, besides this, um, besides the brandies and the rums, like one is like 100 percent. Peated uh, whiskey. Um, you know, we only got one barrel, but you know we put that back. But it allowed us to really blow out the smoke on all of that malt and just really go nuts. <laughs> go uh, make so, it Texas Octomore. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, and that's our goal. Um, and then we're able to do like 100% Texas smoked uh, whiskey that was all Texas malt, mm -hmm. um, and then um, oak and peach from a local orchard. Down the road. Oh, nice! And so that was kind of fun to do, like an all Texas whiskey. So the smokehouse has really been, um, you know, a big one for us, and given us a lot of, um, you know, creative abilities to play with different woods and even different herbs, um, peat, things like that. Yeah, so. that's. And this is obviously you were saying you you have the. Uh, uh, super heavily peated one you're playing around with. This is relatively light. It's yep. it's not so subtle that you you just barely pick it up. Uh, but so another reason why I spent most of my brewing career, you know, thinking I didn't like whiskey, because I'm not a big peat guy. Mm -hmm. um, I can handle some, and and so um, Tommy, my business partner, uh, is just a big peat head. You know, he loves the dark bags, the Freuds, and right. so. Um, Right when this was too much for me, and it's still not enough for him, we, we met in the middle and we said stop. So <laughs> this is the balance. I would agree. I'd say light to medium peat level. Right. Um, it's definitely not going to melt your face or knock you over. No, but, but it's, it's definitely there. It's absolutely present. It's unmistakable. And it's that nice kind of, um, I suppose coming from Ireland, it's that nice kind of more floral, uh, heathery, earthy peat than, than uh, something that has that salty medicinal the iodine. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. There's not not nearly so much of that, and mm -hmm. it's it's more. Uh, and there, there's so many components to peat: the you know the phenol, yeah. the smoke, the the medicinal iodine, the <laughs> the, the the salt, um, the brine, and and I, I I finally decided I'm just not a big um, medicinal guy. I'm not a big guy. Sure. So I, I thought it was the phenols, but no, I think the phenols aren't really that bad. It's, right. It's, it's, it's really the, the those real, um, you know, iodine medicinal ones. Right. So not up my alley. But, yeah. Yeah. Everybody's got their own thing, and everything's changing. So I'm, I'm sure uh, over the years that would change as well. So. Yeah, that's that's really nice. How it's 
you know, it, it doesn't just scream Pete mm -hmm. right out the gate, but once you, especially on the finish there, you go, oh, I, I know what that is. That's that's a nice floral Pete. This one we're playing with some um, pale chocolate, and we're also playing with some Munich and some some crystal malt, so I get a real nice, you know, kind of a dark chocolate mm -hmm. um, finish to it, um, almost kind of... Um, Almost a little leathery or almost yeah. coffee like. Yes. Yes. More and more just a rich dark chocolate. Um, and then our cast finish of this same whiskey. Okay. So this is the same mm -hmm. Reverend Oak, the, yep. the peated, but finished in what kind of? A tawny cast? port cast. Tawny port. So this, to me, takes this whiskey from eh to just, just you know, out of this world. Um, the Reverend Oak is, is a great whiskey. It's fairly one-dimensional in the peat direction. Mm -hmm. so, uh, peat and malt, you know, not too much craziness going on. This brings all kinds of other cool elements in, uh, mainly fruity elements. Um, so you're getting all the cool dark fruit um, that you get from, from a typical cast finish like this. The, um, the raisins, the, the, the plums, the dark cherries, and then all the nuttiness, the almonds, and and all that good stuff as well. That Okay, I don't think I've had this before, but uh, that has me very excited to try yeah. it, because yeah. the, the, the fruit and smoke elements yeah. combined together, really, like that's that's mm -hmm. my sweet spot. Go Pete and Port. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's nice. And so it's Tawny Port, that's the less sweet. I believe so. Versus, it's, versus it's Ruby Port. Somewhat translucent, you can kind of see through it a little bit, versus Ruby, which just looks like red wine. Right. Yep. Um, right. They're both going to be, yeah, that raisiny, almondy, oxidized dessert wine, um, which I'm a huge fan of. Mm. Um, sherry, all those, I'm a huge fan of. Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. And for me, this really, you know, um, makes the, the whiskey interesting to me personally um, because it just has a lot more complexity. You know, you go from kind of that dry, um, kind of uh, iodine peat into the kind of sweet um, estuary fruit. Right. And then finishing that, that nice, you know, dark chocolate um, character. So, yeah, this is definitely you know, one of my favorites that we've done. Yeah, I tend to think about it in, in, uh, in terms of you have your core malt flavors and uh, you know different characteristics of all the different types of malt you were describing mm -hmm. and then you have the uh, the couple of notes that come from the peat uh, as kind of circling around that core and then you have that accent contrast mm -hmm. from the port as well that that just adds sort of a whole layer of complexity to it versus the uh, versus the regular expression mm -hmm. my favorite on on the revenant is somewhere around probably 90 proof somewhere in there Okay. It helps bring the smoke out a little bit more. So yeah, we, we can go back and revisit the regular moment too with a little water. That one. Oh, all, right. all the smoky ones, just I find. And you can see that reaction happen in the glass, right? Yeah. It's you're you're making all the oils kind of separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. It got much more the peat pops now. All of a sudden. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, not hundred proof. The the alcohol just alcohol just hides and wraps things up. Right, and, and um, you know as years are able to add a little water and let some of those um, oils that can no longer be dissolved at that low alcohol percentage come out of solution. Oh wow, yeah, that's super way peatier. Yeah, and uh, wow, it's almost sort of like an anise type thing that jumps out at me. Um, yeah, I think that's that's interesting. I see a lot of people, um, and I'm absolutely guilty of this as well, thinking barrel proof is always better. Uh, you know, there's advantages to it. There is, there is. But thanks for your buck. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. But and this is me personally, as far as drinking cast strength stuff, it's pretty rare for me um, in general because mm -hmm. just for that reason, alcohol just really hides so many flavors. Right. Um, and not not that you need to drop everything down to eighty by any means at all. Right. Um, but somewhere. Possibly less than 130, though. <laughs> right, right. Um, is where you're actually going to taste it, and not just also nuke your taste buds. Right. All of a sudden, exactly. you'll, you'll notice you have a really extra numb mouth after you've had some of that. Well, you've yeah. literally destroyed those taste buds. They'll go back in an hour or two, but you know, <laughs> you've just they are dead for now. <laughs> you've anesthetized everything. Yeah. yeah. And so, how that is more taste, I don't know. But and, and this is my personal preference. Uh, Nothing wrong with drinking castrated at all. Sure, sure, exactly. Well, and it, it, it does enable you to. Um, 
to start at full strength and then play with it, yep. see what happens, right? Whereas exactly. if you're starting very low, it's it's rare that, that adding water to it's gonna do much beneficial, right? If you're starting at 80, you really can't. Yeah. You, know, you can't add anything really for most whiskeys. Yeah, this just got super interesting <laughs> with adding the water though. And I normally, I, every once in a while when I feel like it's gonna help, I, I'll add a little water, but I, I normally just don't even think about it. Yep. And well, it's definitely worth evaluating as the distiller intends. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, try it as they intend it first. Um, but yeah, but we'll we'll be very open with people you know, saying that probably the sweet spot on most of these is gonna be less than 100, in my opinion. Um, so we've overshot them intentionally. Mm -hmm. to, to allow that, um, that addition of water after the fact. Or ice mainly. You know, a lot of a lot of people are big on their ice. I'm, I'm not a nice guy, but uh, an ice guy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that is uh, that allows for a little bit of that, a little melting. Sure, sure. So you're not somebody who just takes their whiskey on the rocks all the time. Then when they're doing it with your whiskey, it doesn't automatically sort of kill the Get whole thing. Water down yeah. very quickly before you're done. Yep. And you know what? To me, what starts to come out too, and this is what's really big on Balcones whiskeys, is is almost an umami, like an almost a meatiness to it. Right. Um, and that's kind of in, wrapped up in that chocolatey finish. I feel that's that's coming out a lot more now. Mm. I feel than, than it was earlier. I mean, it's just that rich. Like, and I can only describe it as an umami. It's almost meaty, meaty like in its in its yeah. intensities, and I'm sure it's based on some kind of rich oils that are coming through. For all the savory and floral and sweet, uh, or sorry, for all the sweet notes, all the fruity notes, all the floral notes, you get that savory. Mm -hmm. so, so. Okay. Sure. So the last one we have here is is the one when I, I told you this is the the one year anniversary of us coming here for the very first time. Just serendipitously uh, happens to be today and this was the one that grabbed my attention the most as being incredibly unique uh, the striker this is our baby yeah. yeah yeah this is definitely our baby whereas we've uh, talked about tradition this is this is where innovation um, steps up a little bit we're definitely not the first distillery to make a smoked whiskey <laughs> by yeah. meat right um, but there's definitely not a lot of them out yet um, you know we're we're kind of taking a layering approach to our smoke and our, our wood choice as well. Um, we feel that um, we're really sticking with Texas barbecue tradition. That's oak, mm -hmm. and um, so oak is the primary wood. And you, know, you can kind of um, we kind of view it as maybe the body um, of of the the smoke flavor. Mm -hmm. um, second would be our fruit wood. Um, we're using mostly apple. And, and, and so that's an accent um, and to the to the body essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so it might be you know 70 to 80 percent oak, um, maybe 60 to 70 percent oak, and then maybe 10 to 20 percent apple. Um, and then the final touch um, of accent is mesquite. And uh, mesquite is just a really powerful force when it comes right. to smoking. You can definitely over smoke things with mesquite, like you cannot with other woods. Um, and so. That, that's that's the accent. Um, that's the very you know small kind of touch that definitely comes through. Um, and so we feel like that layered approach to um, to, to smoking the barley, um, we feel really it brings a lot of cool, interesting flavors to it. Yeah, it adds a complex smoke character. Where was the inspiration for that? Were you like, was this your favorite combination when making barbecue on a on a pit? Or you know, I know we had some. We were going uh, using malt with Blacklands for a long time, and they had some options. I think those were the options we had at the time. I see. And we kind of played with the amounts and the kind of the, the strategy of layering them, um, what, I, what I call layering. Um, and um, and so, yeah, and so it turns out, yeah. We, like I said, we've done some peach and a few other woods um, since then, but we feel this is just a really nice mix. Oh, it's, it's absolutely uh, gorgeous. And, and I tend to like, so like, Balcones. Balcones, of course, has brimstone, uh, yep. which is fantastic. Which is fantastic. Much more um, sort of intense, aggressive, uh, and but amazing in its own way. And uh, Cole Keegan out of Santa Fe mm -hmm. uses uses mesquite, but just I think it was like thirty percent mm -hmm. is uh, is smoked. Uh, Del Bach out Del of Bach. Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, and a few other guys are, are doing the hardwood smoked thing. But this one really, really has always stood out to me. And a big inspiration for us has been Ranger Creek, also. Ranger Creek with the rimfire, yep. yeah. And that's always been, uh, you know, one of my favorite whiskeys to have on the shelf. And, and really, if any of these compare, I would say Rimfire of all the other commercial examples is probably the sure. uh, most um, But their, their mesquite's very subtle because they're making it from their mesquite smoke porter. 
-hmm. One thing we found is if you do want to have a whiskey flavor, uh, excuse me, a smoke flavor in your whiskey, your beer has to be undrinkable. <laughs> sure. It's it just, I mean, to come through. So so the Red Fire is pretty subtle on whiskey. That's why I like it, because the beer is drinkable. Right? <laughs> Are you um, doing a, a certain percentage of the barley being smoked versus yeah. not? Yeah, for us, it's not much at all. I mean, we're talking, you know, on some of these, so we'll heavily smoke, and so for us, it's anywhere from 10 to 20 percent. Interesting. Wow. And it really comes through. That's because uh, one other distillery we spent time with, as I mentioned, was uh, Santa Fe Spirits with the Cole Keegan single malt, and I remember them being about 30 percent. Uh, but this, maybe it's the layering of the different types of smoke. This this seems a bit more smoky to me. And it's, and it's really, and, and the, 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 the smoke can really vary. Yeah, yeah of course, yeah. Yeah, and so, and so it's probably not hard to get malt that could be ten times smoky as other malt. Right. And you, you can see that sometimes with, um, when you order peated malt, they'll give you a phenol scale. And it can be from 20 to 60 from the same manufacturer. Right. And, and so it can be all over the place. And so... Um, that might have you know, a lot to do with that. I, I think I've had Coke again. It's nice and smoky, but not yeah. terribly more than ours, probably. And I think there's a certain Same element, neighborhood. probably too, of like what I'm thinking of as as aggressive smoke character, maybe yep. to somebody else. I know Gretchen, for example, she'll she'll drink something occasionally that is uh, not smoked at all, but she says, "Oh, this tastes smoky," and like what registers to her is smoky isn't quite the same as what I think of, um, but yeah, this one... And you know, then after that, the still is going to make a huge difference. Oh, okay. smoke is all in tails, typically. Yeah. And so depending on how your still collects tails and how much of the tails you collect. Because it's a heavier... Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so I know, um, off the record, but I, I was with, with uh, the Chris Brothers and we tried the Balcony Speed. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. delicious. But I was amazing how light the peat was. Yeah, it's and not that was a hundred percent peated malt. I think. Really? I think so. It was Golden Promise peated. Right. They got a special batch of it. I'm pretty sure it's a hundred percent. And that's really not that peaty. No, and that's their still. Got to be. Yeah. I mean, Got to be. And they're still just. And then the, the the amount that they went into tails and stuff like that. So that's a great example of how much other things can vary. I don't want to bash that whiskey because no, it's good it's um, quite good yeah but um, that that was my that was my surprise observation i don't know if you what you thought uh, the peat level on it was but i was it's, i was expecting to be a, a peat monster it's absolutely it subtle not yeah uh, and uh, i i went up there for a couple of the uh the, the last two of their master class uh, series that they were doing mm -hmm. i did a blending one and then just the last one here was uh on whiskey appreciation and so they'll bring full cast strength samples of, you know, this is European oak, this is American oak, this is uh, X Rumble, this is X Buffalo the Trace, uh, all malts, right? And one of them, uh, two of them, one was new oak peated and one was used oak peated. I think that was the X Buffalo Trace one. Mm -hmm. And even those at like full strength, you know, it, you can tell it's there, but it's, you know, it's not yeah. as smoky as you would expect. And, and maybe we need to revisit whether or not it's 100%. Um, but I, I even remember the Facebook post they did when they mashed in. Because we were doing a peated whiskey back then, and we were kind of all vying to be the first Texas peated whiskey, which I think we were yeah. on the market. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I think that's true, actually. Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. sure we were, actually, because theirs just came out. I don't know if anyone else is doing it, really. Right. Uh, and so... Yeah, like, it stuck in my mind, and uh, when I called Jared, I was like, "Oh, don't be with you." <laughs> so they ended up getting an entire shipping container, or, or more than that, a rail car full of that malt. Right. The only way they could get it was to get a whole rail car of it. So yeah, they had to use a lot of it. Yeah, that was a that was a great whiskey, but for it being advertised as the peated version. Of Balcones, yeah. Yeah, yeah Balcones, you're like... a brimstone version of <laughs> exactly. peat, which would have been incredible. Yeah. Exactly, you would have thought. Well, what they need to do is, whatever process they use to make brimstone, they need to use that with peat. It's yeah. Like whatever yeah. they're bubbling through, whatever they're doing. We think we've mimicked something very similar um, by by smoking low wines and then running it through the still again. Ah, I see. Okay. We've tried smoking finished whiskey and it just tastes like shit. Right. It's all the phenols. It tastes like real plastic. I right. mean, serious plastic. All the phenols are there. So that second distillation, I guess, cleans up a lot of them. Uh, it, it was pretty close. That's interesting. <laughs> that's got to be pretty similar to, I remember seeing, uh, I know Rex and Daniel did on the on, uh, Whiskey Vault one time, and I've seen a few others uh, where you smoke a glass with whiskey in it <laughs> and let it sit, and, it's, and it was like, if you let that sit for 10 seconds, it becomes damn near undrinkable, yep. right? Because all of that... And it's not a pleasant smoke. Again, no. it's just, I mean... Ridiculously plasticky, right? Um, and so, yeah, there's 
We, we didn't know if it was, I mean, is it the hose we're using? We tried everything. You know, still plastic gives the smoke. It's phenol. Interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, this is, this, this, I don't know. I really like the cast finish one. Striker is the one that, I don't know, I, I, I got to have it in the cabinet all the time because I'm a huge fan of it. Yeah, and this is 100% uh, new barrel. Um, you know, this is kind of our, we lovingly call our Texas Scotch. And so, you know, we really wanted to use more of an American you know, whiskey tradition when it came to the barrel aging. Um, you know, we, we feel Americans really like dark whiskey. Yeah. Um, and with the, the, the smoky and the roasted character, we felt, you know, all those extra cool, like vanilla and barrel characters would go really well with that as well. And kind of turned it into, you know, the, the, the idea for this is kind of a sweet barbecue type of thing. Kind yeah. of like that, that bacony, hickory apple type. Um, right. With cherry barbecue. That really appeals to an American flavor profile. I mean, it's absolutely not bourbon, but you get some of that same rich, sweet caramel, uh, yeah. vanilla... Notes and there. when we get bourbon drinkers come in, this is often where we steer them. But we warn them, hey, it is not bourbon. It is absolutely not. But, but you've got a little bit of the but, yeah, vanilla and oak will be there, and yeah, yeah like you say, some of those coconut lactones, and yep, ketones. Yeah, that's uh, that's something I always end up picking up on it, especially as it sits in the glass for a little bit. Is it always reminds me of like malted milk, just a bit. Mm -hmm. um, like what's those milk dots? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the probably the number two ingredient is, is multi bar because those yeah. uh, or grape nuts. Okay, so grape nuts are made from multi bar. So, uh, Cheers! I think that's cool for the flight, right? Cool. Yeah.